Absolutely. So, I mean, there's this whole world out there of real things that are going on. Um, and if we want to build technology that interacts with the real world, we need to be able to basically take information from the real world and process it and use it to make decisions. This is the Voice of Innovation podcast. I'm Rachel Gordon, an AI and robotics reporter. And I'm Pupa Korobande. I'm the Vice President of Product at Sentient Corporation. Today, we're speaking with Daniel Sutanayaka. He's the head of machine learning at Edge Impulse, where he's working on taking what we know about machine learning and shrinking it down as much as possible. He's also one of the brilliant minds working on TensorFlow Lite at Google. He co-authored a book to educate generations of developers on machine learning with TensorFlow Lite on Arduino and ultra low power microcontrollers, among many other things. Daniel, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Hey, thank you so much for having me on here. And thank you for the far too kind introduction as well. Okay, Daniel, I saw a headline from Wired. I'm obsessed with Wired. I love Wired. Saying that at Edge Impulse, you're making machine learning easy. So this seems like really high praise for something that's pretty technical. So why do we need to bring data processing closer to the data source? Yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, there's this whole world out there of real things that are going on. Um, and if we want to build technology that interacts with the real world, we need to be able to basically take information from the real world and process it and use it to make decisions. And the whole model that we have um, kind of historically with AI and, and machine learning is based around this idea of centralization and that you've got some big beefy server somewhere um, generally because of the fact that a lot of these algorithms are, are quite computationally expensive. Um, and then you've got a bunch of sensors out there in the world that are soaking up information and sending it to a, uh, a big beefy machine in the middle that's then processing it and trying to understand what's going on. Um, and you know, that model's okay for some things. Uh, it's led to a, a lot of successful products. It works really well with things like the web, where we've got like, I don't know, recommending products for people to buy based on their purchasing history. But it all starts to fall down a little bit when we're dealing with data out there in the real world. If I want to um, use a, a machine learning algorithm to understand what's going on in my backyard, um, to do that, I need to get the data from sensors that are monitor monitoring things about my backyard. Maybe like I've got a camera looking out for interesting wildlife or um, a microphone listening for bird song. Um, and I, I want to be able to identify when different cool things are happening. I don't necessarily want to have to take all that data and send it into the cloud. Um, first of all, it's really expensive to do that from an energy point of view. Um, if we've got IoT devices out there that are collecting data, um, it's quite quite um, sort of low energy to collect data, but sending it via radio or whatever mechanism, um, whether it's like satellite or um, mobile, 5G, whatever, uses huge amounts of energy. Um, secondly, the cost of having these connections is pretty high. So having a... Um, constantly streaming wireless connection from an IoT device to a server introduces a, a lot of expense. And thirdly, there are big privacy implications of having always on sensors around, you know, in our in our built environment. So those are those are three of my kind of favorite reasons why this technology is so exciting, because if you can break that connection and do the processing down at the edge of the network where the data is generated, you can do far more because there are so many use cases where it just isn't feasible to send the data in that way. Yeah, I totally agree actually. And um, I also agree on the reasons for um, having processing right on the edge. I also think it enables some interesting use cases. Um, my kids have a really hard time understanding what I do. So anytime I can relate it to pop culture, it helps me. And 
a few months ago, I think there was an article on Hackstra about the rats that can be used to detect landmines using um, these backpacks with machine learning um, algorithms on them. And then I think it was last week that people talked about it on uh, The Daily Show. So then I told my kids, oh, this is stuff that we work on. And they they really related to it. Uh, Do you have any of your favorite use cases that you want to highlight? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I mean, my examples <laughs> kind of gave it away, but I'm a big fan of the use of machine learning in conservation. And it's interesting because this, this technology, the ability to run sophisticated ML algorithms on small devices at the edge of the network is fairly new. Um, it's only been accessible for really a couple of years. Um, and uh, some of the first people to adopt it were researchers in the mm-hmm. conservation community who are needing ways to understand what's going on in potentially remote locations where there isn't good connectivity. And it turns out this technology solves some really serious problems they have. So for example, imagine you want to monitor the population of a certain type of animal um, in a certain location. One way to do that is to put out camera traps, which are these automatic um, kind of motion activated cameras that snap a picture anytime something moves. And you just throw out a bunch of them in in strategic places. And when an animal wanders past, it takes a picture and you can then go out there when the memory cards have filled up and collect them and count the animals and get some estimate of the the population. And, you know, that's an oversimplification, but um, they're, they're a really useful tool for conservationists. So the problem is, imagine you've got this camera trap out there in the middle of the jungle somewhere um, and it's got a memory card on and anytime any motion happens, it's going to take a picture and start filling up the card. So maybe you're, you really care about um, tigers that are wandering around in the jungle, but every so often a squirrel comes past and sets off the, the sensor and takes a picture and you end up with a memory card full of squirrels and you have to spend like $2,000 flying out to some remote location hike through the jungle for four days to get the camera and then all it has is a bunch (laughs) of selfies from squirrels um so i i think it's just exciting to see like this is a brand new technology and immediately people have found a way to use it for Mm -hmm. something that's truly yeah i actually hate squirrels i find them (laughs) (laughs) oh no i love squirrels no there's something very (laughs) off-putting about them i find them sneaky but yeah, no, like if you've got a huge farm and, and you want to have water sensors or moisture sensors, light sensors, all that stuff, so you can get a good sense of where you need to deploy resources, this is a really exciting thread as far as you know sustainability and climate control can go. But why isn't tiny ML mainstream yet? I know there's a lot of challenges having these constrained environments and, and memory, but I... I just am wondering why this isn't as widely adopted yet if there with all these purported benefits, right? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, I think it comes from this kind of confluence or convergence of technologies um, that has only really become possible recently. So we've had on the algorithm side, you know, it's only been a decade or so since things like sophisticated deep learning, computer vision, became a thing. Um, so we've got these new new possibilities on the algorithm side that have matured along the, the same timeline as the tooling that allows regular people to train models that can do this type of thing. Um, there's stuff that's, you know, been, been pretty inaccessible to regular developers until quite recently. Then at the same time, we've had the hardware maturing and getting to the point where we've got 32-bit microcontrollers that can run these types of algorithms fast enough to be useful and have enough memory to be useful and and come at a a price point uh, that makes it accessible for the types of projects people uh, are wanting to build. And then we've got all these new types of hardware coming through, accelerators that are designed specifically to run deep learning models on device without using too much energy. So we're really just at the moment where all of these things have started to come together, where you can get accessible tooling, you can 
find algorithms that are effective for solving the right types of problems. And we've got the hardware that will run these things in the field. So it's, it's just the beginning of the journey because there are still more big problems to solve. Things like, how do you get data? Um, data is always the big blocker. And um, where in some domains, there are big public data sets available, like for computer vision. In other domains, like monitoring industrial machinery, there's you know almost no data in comparison. So we're still at the start of this journey, uh, but things are going to get easier and more accessible and more yeah. widely understood. Before we keep talking about embedded systems, I do want to talk about your professional lineage a little bit because it's incredibly impressive. You're an engineer, a teacher, a founder, a communicator in this field. You know, you work at Edge, TensorFlow Lite at Google. You author this really important book on TinyML. You've worked on conversational AI. You co-founded Tiny Farms, which I'm really excited to talk about later, which focuses on automated protein production from insects. So tell me, tell me about your work history. Yeah, so first of all, I've got to try not to blush. <laughs> Just from the, facts. <laughs> the, the far too <laughs> kind in, introduction. But um, yeah, I've done a lot of, of crazy random stuff, really. And there is there are some themes going through it. But I, I think like what I'm excited about is like building systems that allow you to bridge the gap between computers and the real world, because I love computers. I always have, you know, I was a kind of little kid where I was programming age eight on like old computer that my parents had and like just always, always been interested in like taking things apart and looking at circuit boards and trying to figure out what's going on. But um, I, I also love the real world um, and I'm not content to just sort of live in a little mm. darkened room coding all day. And so trying to find a way to kind of bridge the gap between those two things. And I started out, um, I, I was working at a university in the UK, Birmingham City University, um, doing stuff around auto ID technologies, which are like, it's kind of a bit of an outdated term these days, but um, at the time it's like this kind of collective word for all these things that can let you understand a little bit about the real world using computers. So barcoding for tracking items, um, RFID for, for tracking items and storing data on them. Uh, things like biometrics, like face recognition and face detection and fingerprint recognition. And there are all these sort of fairly straightforward, very basic at the time ways of uh, just keeping track of what's going on in, in the real world. And over the last, 20 years that stuff has just gone crazy we've gone from like really rudimentary basic kind of um hand coded feature extraction algorithms for face detection through to deep learning based systems that can you you, know, you take a big data set of faces and, and train a, an embedding model and then you can use that to understand how similar mm -hmm. two faces are to each other and and all this amazing stuff and we're, we're just living at this time where this type of technology is like blown up and become part of everything. You've now got like face recognition based built into your phone. Um, that happens with almost zero latency mm -hmm. when you want to unlock it. And, um, there are so many different uses for this type of technology through different places. So what we're doing at edge impulse is trying to unlock this for everybody to use. So like, how can we how can we make these types of technology accessible to everybody? Um, but then I've kind of gone through some of those struggles myself with technology not being accessible because I I started a company doing agricultural automation and we're we're using AI and IoT in that context and we ran into a lot of challenges where like hey this tooling is really difficult to use or it's it's not clear how these two things that could work together really well would actually connect. Um, so I think I've, I've sort of experienced a lot of these points of friction along the way that have led me to want to help to make it easier for people to do this type of work. Um, and the, the reason is that I think software engineers <laughs> are quite like arrogant about thinking we can solve any kind of problem that's out there. Like I, you know, I don't know much about agriculture and then went to try and 
start an agricultural technology company. Um, and there is some merit to that. Like it's cool to, to bite off things that you, you're going to have a hard time chewing and try and be ambitious. But I think what we need to do better as a, a technology industry is build tools for domain experts to solve the problems that they really deeply understand. Um, and I, I hope that the work that we're doing at Edge Impulse is going in that direction where we're, we're trying to build tools that allow someone who's an agricultural expert to train their own model and deploy it to devices um, or somebody who's an expert in whatever it is from like building kids toys through to um, creating spacecraft like whatever those things are like people have deep expertise and the future of technology is about making sure that people can apply their expertise using the tools that have been created by yeah the rest absolutely of and i mean you've been working on all of these implementation tools for so long which is kind of the lifeline that connects intelligence to hardware to enable inference on edge devices for ai applications and i'm sure you can explain that a little bit better in technical depth but, you know basically like tensorflow Lite, it's a it's a mobile library for deploying models on mobile and microcontrollers so now that you've worked at these various places what are the advantages of edges framework to tensorflow Lite, to pytorch Yeah, so I, I was very lucky to get the opportunity to work at Google um, with the TensorFlow Lite team. And I was kind of there in the right place at the right time where I'd been looking for something interesting involving like low level machine learning stuff. Um, and they were looking for somebody to, to join. And I, I just happened to be there at the moment that TensorFlow Lite Micro was being launched. And um, so TF Lite. And TF Lite is Google's framework for deploying TensorFlow models to the edge. But it started out with um, the idea of deploying models to mobile phones, which is probably you know the most most beloved and widespread used edge device uh, with a super powerful processor. It's kind of a, a, an obvious place to start if you're going to try and run models somewhere. Um, so the TensorFlow Lite team after launching that product kind of realized there's the opportunity to go smaller if you can make things more efficient um, and have less baggage required for um, the bringing along with the library then maybe you can start to run models on really tiny devices like microcontrollers and so tensorflow Lite micro came out of that effort and um, the 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 thing that's really cool with tf Lite micro is that google weren't just like hey we're going to build this framework um, and throw it out there but actually pete warden who's kind of the the visionary guy behind the the whole thing realized that the problem that needed to be solved was making sure that there's good support for lots of different types of hardware um so what they did was reach out to chip manufacturers and work with chip manufacturers to make sure that there's support for accelerating the inference of of deep learning networks on these devices um, for, for a lot of different hardware, because otherwise, you, you know, you might have something that works really well on one device, but doesn't work on another device or something that works well on one device, but is really slow on another. Um, so they came up with this idea of kind of pulling, pulling things together and getting good support across the board for getting good performance on a good baseline of, of devices. Um, and in the process, they created this interpreter-based um, library, which it takes a model, passes the model, and then runs through the model step by step and calls out to the code implementation for different pieces of the model. A model, you can think of it like a graph, and it would like run a different bit of code for every bit of the graph. And that's a good approach because it's nice and flexible. It's easy to work with. It's easy to debug. Um, but it does have some limitations. There's some overhead involved anytime you're using an interpreter rather than just mm. executing code directly. And so what we did at Edge Impulse is take the awesome open source code that um, has you know, been created by TensorFlow Lite Micro and its contributors and wrapped that in some code generation magic so that we basically take a model 
And instead of like interpreting the model and calling out to these different functions, we actually just generate some code that directly calls the functions in the right order, passing in the right data in order to execute the model. Um, so by doing that, we've been able mm -hmm. to reduce the overhead involved with, with running the model. So it uses less ROM, less RAM, and it's a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. But this is just one approach to making deep learning run quickly on embedded devices. And there's a, a few different ones. So another noteworthy way is to use some kind of compiler that takes a model and directly generates machine code from the model. Um, there are other ways where you can have different types of interpreters which uh, execute a graph in a virtual machine sort of space. And you can do all sorts of interesting graph compilation stuff to create optimizations mm -hmm. that make sense in that space. Uh, so there, there are a few different approaches here. And I think it all depends on the target you're um, trying to deploy to, which is the best. And I see in the future, like the, there's always going to be more and more tools and more ways to deploy. And what we need to do is create a, an easy way of doing all of those types of deployments if you have a model that you've created. Um, and so hopefully that's one of the big benefits of Edge Impulse. You can target loads of different devices that all mm -hmm. use these different types of approaches and you don't have to do anything extra. You've got your model that you've trained and you can click a button mm -hmm. and hopefully it works. Pupak, what are you seeing in the field as far as, you know, a lot of these simple models are on Arduino type or systems and Raspberry Pi type systems. So do you think that we're going to end up in a more FPGA or ASIC direction if you really want low, low power? I think it's interesting because we see a lot of, um, maybe I would just classify them as the general public, even though they're all engineers as well, playing around and, and supporting these use cases on Arduino type boards or um, basically small, easy to use things. Uh, but still we see that um, the stuff that goes to production and ends up being big volume, ends up being purpose-built solutions. So um, I think as Daniel alluded to at the beginning, we're still at the precipice of people having the tools to be able to play around. So it's, it's great for enabling interesting use cases like the you know, the landmine detecting rats. And we had another use case that was used um, on the tiny ML board that we had with our first generation device that was um, detecting malaria carrying mosquitoes by the sound of their buzzing. These are all really super interesting use cases. And there's definitely benefit to um, <clears throat> allowing the general public or maybe not they don't have the, the power of Google behind them <laughs> to be able to play around with these with these tools and develop models that are robust and can can do stuff in the field. Um, but it's still pretty early on. So potentially in the future, we'll be going more towards those. Um, you know, anybody can build anything on anything uh, models, but it's still a little bit early, I think. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about the the idea that this like um execution graph for a model is kind of a, mm -hmm. a universal language to express all of these different things you can do. And then there's this other step after that that can take that graph and express it in whatever the target needs. And that could be a processor implementation. There's no reason you can't directly generate a accelerator from a, a network. And there's some folks out there who have built tools yeah. that allow you to do that kind of thing. So it's it's going to be really interesting to see how this goes in the future and um, the, the, you know, balance we end up with between things that are running on general purpose compute versus things that are running on very hyper specific. Yeah. I think type. the use case that you alluded to with, so this is my personal opinion, just because I've been looking at it, but on the industrial applications where um, I think there's going to be a lot of small use cases that um, they need to be deployed kind of on a case by case basis. Right. So if you imagine like a, 
um, predictive maintenance application in factories. It's going to vary specifically by the type of uh, machine that you have in the factory, the environment. It's going to be very, very costly and prohibitively costly, actually, to try to have purpose-built solutions for that. That's a perfect application for these kind of general purpose solutions that then you can um, you can maybe even allow the you know, companies who are specialized in industrial manufacturing as opposed to in machine learning, be able to collect their own data, train their own models, deploy it on the on their own factory floors, which I think those kind of applications will be will definitely benefit from the general purpose solutions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Really okay, so we're talking a lot about tiny ML, but we're also kind of in this age of obsession with large language models. It's like a big little trade-off. Um, and I've kind of noticed where a lot of the most interesting ML systems that have caught the mainstream's attention really have been the large models. It's GPT-3, it's DALI, and these don't fit on embedded systems. So are there interesting applications for large models that you'd want running on an embedded context? And do you think we could get these types of programs running on such hardware, maybe with knowledge distillation or distributed computing? Yeah, this is where I think things are gonna <laughs> blow people's minds. I think we're, we're at the beginning of this journey of optimizing hardware to run deep learning workloads and it's all you know work that's been done over the last few years and it's still so early and i think there's going to be this massive curve of improvements in the amount of compute that you can do with a specific power budget or on a, on a specific sort of small cheap device um and i think it's going to be very very rapid that we see crazy things that you would have thought are impossible um i mean even in my you know time in in this field at the beginning no one was running vision mm -hmm. models on microcontroller and then suddenly everyone's running vision models on microcontrollers and it just you know had seemed completely inaccessible and now we're running vision models in real time on microcontrollers and you know a couple of years from now I totally see that we're going to be doing things like full real time transcription with really good accuracy of audio. So we have this whole assumption of like, you've got something like the Google assistant or Siri or whatever, and it gets woken up by some on device keyword spotting algorithm. But after that, it captures all of what you're saying and sends the audio to a server to be processed by a big model. And I think that's just going to go away. We're, we're going to do everything on device. And you already see that with um, some mobile phones have like built in on device transcription models. They're still in the tens of megabytes. So they're still too big to run performantly on a microcontroller. But with the types of accelerators and types of architectures that people are working on right now, and, and even on the algorithm size with things like structured sparsity and um, deeper levels of, of optimization, we're definitely going to be able to do this type of thing. Um, it's going to be a, a continuum, like it will take a while to get to running this full like GPT-3 type thing on a, a constrained device. And there's going to be obviously some trade-offs that, mm -hmm. that you have to make along the way. But I, I totally think this is coming. Um, and it, I, I'm so excited to see the types of applications people can build once you can embed speech transcription and intent matching and text generation into like a <laughs> greetings card yeah. microcontroller. Yeah, I totally agree. Actually, I mean, Sentian was really built upon this idea of easing the natural interface and really focused on the audio applications. So definitely our first generation devices were on this keywords and wake word um, use cases. We're not quite there yet, but kind of our North Star is to do natural language understanding on the device. And that's that's the direction that we want to start, you know, heading towards more and more. So I totally agree. <laughs> so do you see, do, do you think we're going to be going straight from audio to, you, you know, we're we going to have a natural language understanding model that takes audio as an input, or will we have this kind of stage? With the transcription. 
Yeah, I'm leaning towards the transcription as the as the middle stage as well, um, just because it is so challenging with the with the direct natural language understanding to go straight. <laughs> but so I totally agree with you on that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna Definitely, be, gonna be yeah. super interesting. What what do we need to do to get there? Like, what are some of the steps and problems incrementally that we're working on to get to that space? Well, I think from our side, we're really focusing on this ex accelerator architectures that we're exploring to try to get us there. Still um, within the power envelope that we've set for ourselves for edge devices, um, and. On Daniel's side, you guys are going to have to help us with uh, with new ways of compiling models that are more efficient. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's so much on the the algorithm side with these big models that they it's it, they've come out of this brute force approach, which is how we got all of the big convnets for vision as well. It's like you know how do we figure out how to throw as many parameters as this as we can. Um, but we're going to have to get more efficient if we're going to reduce the size of these things because we're not talking about like an order of magnitude but we're we're talking about models that are like a they have like a terabyte of weights or something um so i think there's a lot of work that we'll have to go into that I, obviously there's going to be like um a lot of motivation pushing the sizes of those down from the companies that are running these things in their data centers because every re reduction in size you you get a reduction in cost so i'm i'm sure there's some very smart people definitely and i was going to say the same thing the motivation side is important right now i think from the consumer side there's not a significant drive at least i think in the u.s to try to do more things on devices there's a little bit more with the privacy aspect that's coming um, at least people don't like cameras in their houses as much as they 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 were open to it in, in the past but i think um if there is more demand by the consumers to not have the audio be sent over uh, to the cloud to be processed there, I think that's also going to help drive this in addition to, to the cost. Um, because what's being done in the big servers is working well from a user experience perspective. It's just that it's very, very energy consumptive and totally not secure and private and all sorts of other things. <laughs> Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem here because you can't get the benefits of it until you've done it. Like once you've cracked it and you can do everything on device, then you get the benefits exactly. of privacy and low latency and everything. But there's not like a, 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 a journey to doing part of it there. Maybe there is, I suppose. I guess we can do keyword spotting on device. I don't know what the next incremental step is from that. Like maybe instead of transmitting raw audio to the cloud we're transmitting vectors that represent certain sounds i don't know um and maybe you still can get yeah. some incremental but I, talking about privacy i think that you know we have these resource efficient on device federated learning algorithms uh tiny fl because you know tiny ml is not enough um, we need just more acronyms. Um, but, you know, federated learning lets phones learn a shared prediction model collaboratively, all while the training data, you know, stays on the device, avoids the cloud. And there's definitely the trade off with noise and accuracy. But it seems like there could potentially be a lot of promise with health data to move away from being more centralized with tiny federated learning. So I, what do you guys think about this? So, yeah, I, th I think it's a super interesting approach, um, however, with some some caveats. So the, the general idea of federated learning is, is awesome that you can do a bit of learning on devices and then combine all of the insights that you've derived across a network of devices into one model and then send that back to the devices. So they can kind of all benefit from the little slice of the world that each of them has seen. Um, so obviously there's big privacy benefits there um, because you're you're not necessarily having to send the data back to a central server for training to take place um, and there are also benefits in just sort of breadth of being able to look at a lot of little corners of the world at the same time 
um, and, and train and model. The, the problem is that it doesn't solve the data problem for you. Um, and the reason is that usually when you're training a model or, or if you're collecting a data set, it's kind of easy to get raw data. Um, it's, it's expensive often and, and difficult and time consuming, but the really hard part with data is having labels for your data that help you make sense of it. There's a huge difference. Like imagine if I captured 24 hours of audio from inside my home of, you know, people talking and things happening by itself, yeah. that's completely useless. But if I label it with like, oh, this was when I was cooking breakfast, this was when I was having a chat, these are the words that I said, then suddenly you can actually use it for, for real things. And the, the issue with things like um, federated learning is that it's often, you don't have a way to find labels when you're on the edge. Sometimes you do. So the, the um, example with the mobile phone keyboards, so you're, you're training a model to predict what words someone was trying to type, even though they're making mistakes. Um, so that kind of comes with labels, because if I type a word and it predicts the wrong one, then I delete the word and type the correct one. So there are these implicit labels in the interaction. Same as if you've got like a user who's operating a machine. So imagine you're, um, I don't know, you've got some automated system in a car um, that's like recommending whether you should drive left or right. And then you can look at whether the user, the user actually drives left or right. Maybe they're doing some complicated parallel parking and the sensor's supposed to help them. Um, so if, if the system told them to turn the wheel left and then they actually turned it right, that's a, a label you can use to say, hey, our prediction was a bit unreliable. Um, but with loads of things, you can't really do that. You can't really do that if we're looking for like animals in the forest, for example, like when the tiger comes past, if I, you know, I don't have a way to distinguish a tiger and a squirrel on the device. And if I did, then I wouldn't need a model. I'd already have some solution that can do it. So there are some problems that are perfect for solving with federated learning, but there are also a lot of problems. I'd say, you know, the vast majority of problems where it doesn't solve that problem, but labels are expensive. So I, I do think we're going to see more evolution in these types of distributed approaches and, and privacy appro preserving approaches. I think it's really promising, but it's not the um, uh, the magic key to unlocking all of these yeah. use cases. Just yeah, I 100% agree. I also don't think it's the, like the panacea of, uh, of uh, doing more on the edge, but definitely a way to move forward and uh, try for specific use cases. Right, right. Okay, so Daniel, you wrote this book with Pete Warden, who uh, we're actually supposed to interview soon. And you were trying to help software and hardware developers in building embedded systems using machine learning. So what did you want to accomplish with this book? Because writing a book is not a small undertaking. Yeah, so I, I mean, it was interesting, the whole process of writing this book. So the goal was um, we've got to get people to be able to use the tools that we're building at Google with TensorFlow Lite Micro. Um, by themselves, they're some C++ libraries and a few readmes and some documentation. Um, but the story of how do you go from like data to having a model which is running on a device using this kind of library is a lot more than will fit into one readme attached to a, an open source library. So um, Pete realized that we, we needed to do something to kind of broaden the accessibility of this type of technology. And Pete's done so much work in this respect, like doing um, online courses and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, but one, one really good avenue for tech stuff is to write a book. And um, so we try to write this book that can basically take you as somebody who maybe knows a bit about machine learning, but nothing about embedded or vice versa, someone who knows a bit about embedded, but nothing about machine learning, or even someone who doesn't know much of either and take you through the very basics of, of building a project, understanding what all the moving parts are and how it works 
and get into something that does something interesting um, using embedded machine learning and kind of gets you over that first hurdle. So it was really exciting writing that and we got a really good reception. But one thing that I realized during the process was that we, we wrote this book that's sort of like how to do the very basics. <laughs> And it ended up being like 400 pages or something. And it's, it's, it's not a small book. And uh, so this stuff really is complicated. And that was part of what went into, you know, why I was so excited about joining Edge Impulse um, when I, I met the founders, because it's, it's still too inaccessible. If you have to read this giant book, we've still got a way to go to improving accessibility and then kind of even beyond that, um, once you know how to use the basic tools, that's only one part of the problem because machine learning is really a way of thinking about software engineering. And it's quite new to most people. Like we've sort of got this typical way of developing algorithms that's, that's quite well established at this point, but machine learning turns it on its head and says, instead of engineering an algorithm, you need to focus on building a data set. And by the way, there are all of these crazy pitfalls and things that can go wrong that are very unintuitive and yeah. you've got to be aware of those. And so Jenny Plunkett, who's an engineer at Edge Impulse um, and I have spent the last year writing another book, which is called AI at the Edge. And it's basically a, a high level guide to people who want to build products in this space. And it goes through literally everything that we can think of from like how to build a data set through to what are the different types of hardware targets you can deploy to? Um, what are the different algorithms available? What are some design patterns for solving different types of problems? Even like, how do you, who do you hire if you're trying to build a team to build an embedded machine learning product? So that's the thick book as well. It comes out in like January, um, but it's, it's about 500 pages or 550 pages, I think. So, uh, even with all of this work that we've put in to try and make things easier, this is a huge field and it's going to require a, a lot of people kind of dipping their toes in an unfamiliar area of engineering, but it's so much more accessible now than it used to be. And we're gradually, you know, making it easier and easier. So my, my hope is that a decade from now, it's something that's in the toolbox of most engineers. Most engineers will be fam familiar with how to train an effective machine learning model to serve. This is why I said that. Wired was uh, doling out some high praise by saying that you're making things easy because this is such a nuanced, intricate part of the field and shrinking everything down that we're just starting to scratch the surface and understand of how this really could could change our lives and especially with sustainability, which I'm, I'm also the most excited about that. So Daniel, what advice would you give to younger people who want to get into the field of tiny ML, either in research or business? Maybe they're feeling a little bit intimidated by it also. What, what would you tell them? Yeah, so that, that question goes really well with what you just said, which is that we've got, we're, we're kind of at the early stage of this whole new thing. And there's so much opportunity in this space for anyone who wants to contribute. I think like if you're interested in this topic at all, now's the time to start learning about it and getting involved. And, um, you know, whether you're a student that's excited just to learn, or if you're an engineer who wants to start using this type of technology, there are so many unsolved problems and little areas where you can improve on something and, and make it better whether it's like tooling for deploying to devices or how do you understand whether a data set is good quality or not. Um, so in, in terms of like things that people could potentially jump in and work on, it's like nearly infinite. I always get excited. Like I, my whole life, I always wanted to be there at the start of something. And this is the time where I've lucked out and I've, I've got here at the start of something. And there's this like infinite, horizon of different cool problems to work on and i just encourage anyone um, who's interested to dive in there's so many good resources there's a bunch of books on the topic that that have come out or are coming out um there's a whole bunch of courses including from like coursera and harvard's edx platform um there's 
loads of companies that are building tools that make this type of thing easier. And there are a bunch of open source efforts as well. So whatever your flavor of thing, there, there's a bunch of universities out there that are running degree programs that are focused on tiny ML. Uh, so whatever little bit of it grabs your curiosity, dive in and, and go for it. And um, I, I think there's a lot of potential. A lot yeah, of I agree. I think on the, you, you mentioned all the cool engineering problems that can be solved. I think on the business side of things, because the market is still very much developing as well and people's appetites are just getting tickled at the moment, right? So of what is possible, it's also a super exciting time to kind of enter because I think on the consumer electronics side, there's been, you know, AI on the edge for, for some time, but there's a whole host of other industries that um, I know from my previous jobs that are, have heard about it and they want to, you know, explore it, but they really have no idea how to even go about um, considering it or understanding it. So if you are an engineer that has some business leanings as well, being able to bridge that gap of explaining what is possible to somebody who's probably not a machine learning expert is going to open up a brand new set of opportunities um, that not only is going to be obviously financially lucrative, but also I think we, I truly believe it's going to help make life better for everyone, which is really the ultimate goal of what we're trying to drive here. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so true. I, I think like the the real thing that's exciting here is that AI tools are making the jump from being exactly. something that AI experts can use to being something that all experts can use. So if you're an expert in something, please learn this stuff because it's going to allow you to scale your expertise. Thank you both so much for speaking today. This was amazing. I, I absolutely loved getting to pick both of your brains. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been really cool and I appreciate the really good questions.